Okay, so here's um, our example linear 1D solver. Um, and so in this case, for the first test case, we're going to be looking at a uh, periodic set of boundary conditions where the initial conditions is a sinusoid. So tau here is essentially at the wavelength of our, um, our initial condition. And you notice there's, it's pretty generously commented. It follows along with the derivations pretty closely with the series of lectures. Um, there is some deviation in terms of uh, some of the approaches, but it follows along much the same way. So we see here that we've defined that we have two basis functions. Uh, K here is the number of elements in our discretization. So we'll start off with a generous amount, 32 elements in this case. We sprinkle nodes at the boundaries of our elements. Uh, and then we calculate the size of our elements. And then we will uh, split this up into a set of um, element boundary nodes. And you notice we're actually repeating it twice here because if we think about it, uh, there's going to be two coincident nodes um, at the same point, each associated with a different element. So U here is our exact solution. So here we're calculating what the initial conditions should be. So we're trying to satisfy the condition that the integral of the solution approximation times our basis function, our weighting basis function, should be equal to the integral of our exact solution times our weighting basis function. Um, and this is going to be satisfied across each element, not globally. And so because we have an analytical expression for our uh, initial conditions, then we can get an exact uh, value for the relation between the two. You could imagine if you had something that is a little bit less uh, pleasant to integrate, you could perform um, a high quality numerical integration. You could use like the, uh, the integrate um, function in MATLAB to do this as well. Um, so now we're splitting things up just like we did in the uh, lectures with into the, our mass stiffness and uh, boundary flux pieces. So we can see here very clearly, this looks like the, our mass matrix here, our one third and one sixth terms. And we're putting together our uh, basis weights for our initial conditions. So this is relating our mass matrix with our initial conditions. And so this will give us our initial basis weights. Uh, here we can see that we're accounting for our upwind flux. So you can see the two right columns are the ones associated with the element. So if we're considering to call it element K, then this is the left side and this is the right side of element K. And this is basis weighting basis one and weighting basis two. So we can see that the uh, stiffness only has terms within the element, which makes sense. We're only the stiffness term only accounts for the current element. But we can see that the upwind flux actually references the element upwind of it. So if this is k, and this is k minus one, and this is k minus one at uh, x sub r. So we can see that this looks very similar to our element boundary. Um, and then likewise, we can see here is our uh, calculated uh, stiffness values for our stiffness matrix. And then we put together, essentially we add all these things up, we put together a stencil that accounts for our mass matrix, our uh, boundary element flux, and our stiffness. So this is essentially our, our semi-discrete system minus our uh, basis weights. So we, this is for, the stencil is for a particular element we'd like to assemble the global matrix that uh, accounts for all of the elements together. We could iterate through each element individually, or we could instead assemble it into a large global system. Uh, so we can see here, essentially, we're arranging over each of our elements, and we're just stamping the stencil into our uh, global matrix here, semi-matrix. Um, we do some MATLAB fancy footwork to apply boundary conditions, in this case, periodic boundary conditions. So we're shifting uh, columns from one side to the other so that whatever emerges from the right 
of our global domain will come back in on our, the left of our global domain. Um, and now at this point we have our full semi-discrete system. Now all we need to do is uh, discretize it in, with respect to time. So here we have the control for our particular time step. Uh, you can see that we have this value here is how frequently we save our solution approximation. So you can see in this particular setup we're saving one one hundredth of the uh, values for later plotting. And so what we're doing is then ranging from zero to the number of time steps. The number of time steps is dependent upon what our end time is and our uh, actual time step here. As well as a couple other values for pre-allocation for uh, saved quantities as well as um, how frequently we'd like to save various other quantities for uh, evaluation of the performance of the method. So in this loop we're iteratively time stepping from one time step to the next to the next to the next. So this is a, perhaps a little bit easier to read than this one but these two uh, forms are equivalent. This is what we're applying the forward Euler. So we're saying that the um, time derivative of our basis weights is equal to our global semi-discrete system times our basis weights. So this is not just for one element, but for all the elements combined. And so this will spit out, this is a vector, and this is a matrix. This will spit out a vector um, of the same size as our basis weights. So the basis weights are just a um, set a list of each of the uh, nodes for each element in order across our 1D domain. And so it's the same order for our uh, time derivative of our basis weights. <clears throat> and then we calculate our new basis weights based on our current basis weights plus the uh, predicted change from the forward Euler. So this is rate of change of our basis weights times our time step plus our current basis weights gives us our new basis weights. And notice that we are, uh, as previously stated to save memory, overwriting our previous values. And in situations where we're, uh, we'd like to save the values, then we will save our basis weights to a um, external uh, matrix for later plotting. So at this point, now we've, by the time we emerge from this uh, for loop, we've successfully looped through uh, the entirety of the time period that we're interested in. And so for everything, everything here on out is mostly just post-processing then. So we've ideally like to do this as quick as possible. We don't want to have to wait for plotting while we do this. So this is why we save our values. You could imagine if uh, this was a more complex problem where each time step took a sufficiently long time to compute, you might even plot while we're doing this. So maybe you're, you're doing this in real time or it's not quite real time. You know, this could take an analysis, could take an hour, so it'd be kind of nice to be able to see how the, the analysis is performing while it's uh, calculating so that you could um, prematurely cancel the calculation if it looks like it starts to diverge or have other problems. And so at this point now, we're just plotting our saved values. So we're plotting a couple of things. We're plotting the L2 norm, uh, and this is the calculated up here. This is a comparison of what should be the exact value because it's uh, simple enough to derive the expected analytical uh, solution. And we'll compare that against our currently calculated values. And the norm of this should uh, hopefully be relatively small. If it is, then that indicates that our solution approximation is a good approximation for our uh, for the actual analytical solution. We also will pl um, plot our root mean square of our um, solution. So you can think of this as essentially a quantified uh, amount of energy perhaps in the system. So because we're uh, trying to be explicitly conservative, we would hope anyways, if we're doing things correct, that the root mean square of our uh, solution approximation across our global domain should remain relatively constant. Now the reality is that as time goes on the uh, RMS value will either increase or decrease due to small drifts from uh, floating point precision error. Uh, but 
the um, as long as we're properly converged, that drift will be comparatively small. So let's run this code for uh, 32 elements and see what we get for a result. So this plot has different colored uh, lines for each of the elements. You can see here, here's the time of our uh, current time step and the L2 norm and the root mean square. So because this is a sinusoid, we would expect that the root mean square should be approximately square root of 2 over 2. So if we run this again and take a, keep an eye on the root mean square value, we can see we start out at square root of 2 over 2 and it's slowly drifting upwards. And our L2 norm is pretty good, it's pretty small. So now if we were to look closely at this uh, solution approximation, from far away it looks continuous, but if we were to zoom in at a particular set of elements, we can see that we have discontinuity. So we, we don't enforce continuity across the elements, so it can simply be the case that we do have some discontinuity across, uh, across elements. So if we zoom back out, we can uh, see what the dependency of this is. So for situations where we have a relatively smooth area, there's very little discontinuity visible. Then in situations where we have a uh, larger solution gradient, then we have some discontinuity. And recall that we are using the flux function to account for the uh, flux occurring across this effective discontinuity. The solution is multiply defined here and so our flux function is trying to account for that. So if our velocity is in the positive x direction then this value is what's flowing this way. So this is the value that would be used flowing this way and similarly for each element downstream. So let's look at the situation where we have far fewer elements. So perhaps, let's say, eight elements. Now keep a close eye on the root mean square value. We can see this drops pretty quickly. And our L2 norm is a little, quite a bit higher than the uh, 32 element case. Now, nobody would call this solution approximation pretty, but considering that we're managing to get something pretty good with just eight elements, it's fairly impressive in that sense, especially considering we're just using a, a linear uh, element. So hopefully, if we were to continue to grade in terms of number of elements, we still should get something sensical. And so you can see it's not pretty, but we do see a traveling sinusoid wave. And notice how quickly the root mean square value drops here and how large our L2 norm is. So clearly in this case, you know, nobody would call this a good approximation for our sinusoid, but it's still representing the underlying physical phenomena that we have some sort of sinusoid-like shape being uh, advected across the domain. And so, you know, of course, if we want to get crazy, we can put plenty of elements, and this will take probably a second then to run, and we can see it looks quite good, and our root mean square value is staying pretty steady, and we have a pretty low L2 norm. But notice this isn't really that much better than the 32 element case. And you can imagine a situation where if you perhaps maybe have far too many elements, then you start to get an accumulation of round off error or floating point precision error. Any one element isn't really doing very much lifting. So Let's go back to the, let's go to a, a 32 element case, but now let's vary our time step. Notice we we're looking at this for three seconds, but our time step is very, very small, comparatively speaking. So what happens if we bump it up a little bit? Everything looks pretty good, but notice that our root mean square value, even though we're using 32 elements is changing quite a bit more with the uh, larger time step. And if we decrease the time step, increase the time step too much, then eventually we'll start to see major problems like that. So uh, this is definitely not a good approximation to our solution.
Now, the other thing, so one, thinking about the other things that we'd like to investigate with this, um, what could we, can we do anything to improve this? So clearly for 32 elements, that time step is too big. What happens if, let's say, we increase our number of elements? Does that, whoa, that goes bad very quickly. In fact, I'll just, well, it's going to run its course. So it would seem increasing the elements when the time step is too large is bad. What happens if we decrease the number of elements? Well, it's still definitely not representing the correct answer, but notice, at least in the time that we looked at it, it didn't blow up. And if we continue to decrease our elements, it definitely isn't a very good approximation, but it doesn't blow up either. So it would seem that if our time step is too large, we should decrease our number of elements. Similarly, if we'd like to increase our number of elements, we have to be careful that we have a sufficiently small time step to, per to permit this. So clearly we've been able to explore H convergence and T convergence in this case. We haven't played around at all with our initial conditions, and I'll leave that to you to play around. So what you'll need to be changing is our initial conditions here, and you'll need to modify the uh, specification of the initial coefficients. So this is taking the rather than the interpolation approach this is taking the other approach that i briefly covered when we were looking at the solution approximation uh, you could take an interpolation approach that could be a little bit easier to implement but likewise this is simple enough to to uh, implement if you want to analytically integrate your initial conditions or you could use the the built-in um, matlab integration routine to calculate these weights yourself so I'd recommend you play with a couple different potential input functions and see what the behavior is.